Welcome to Random Book Talk where we're chatting to Kate Forsyth. Now Kate is the international best-selling author of more than 20 books including The Witches of Eliana and Rhiannon's Ride. She's currently undertaking a doctorate in the retelling of fairy tales at the University of Technology. Her latest book is called Bitter Greens and it's our book of the month for April. Welcome Kate. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Now, Bitter Greens is a fabulous retelling of the Rapunzel fairy tale. Can you give us a bit of a clue about what we can expect from the book that isn't in the fairy tale? So much more. I mean, basically with Bitter Greens, I've, I've um, brought out of obscurity this utterly fascinating and brilliant writer of the 17th century. Her name is Charlotte Rose de la Force, and she was cousin to the Sun King. And when she was about my age, he locked her up in a convent for her wild and, and wicked ways. And you know, what did she do to deserve being locked up? Well, she had an affair with an impoverished actor. She you know, used black magic to try and ensnare her husband. She dressed up as a dancing bear to uh, help rescue her young lover. And she wrote scandalous novels about um, the king's more notorious relatives. So, you know, she got locked up in a convent and while she was locked up in the convent, she actually wrote the version of a puzzle, you know, that we best know now. Yeah, right. Mm. Can, do you think that readers need to be uh, aware of the Rapunzel fairy tale in order to fully understand the story? Not at all. Though I think it's a rare person who doesn't know the basic plot line. Probably. And doesn't know, you know, the motifs, you know, the witch, the tower, the impossibly long hair and the prince that helps her to escape. Hmm. What was it that drew you to retell the Rapunzel fairy tale in Bitter Greens? Look, we get asked a lot, where do you get your ideas from? And the in initial impetus for this idea actually reaches way back into my childhood. When I was a little girl, when I was about two years old, I was attacked by a dog and it actually, you know, its jaws went straight through here in the side of my eye and um, destroyed my tear duct. So I spent my childhood in and out of hospital all the time and because I had no tear duct I couldn't control the reduction of my tears. So when I was about seven or eight someone came to visit me and they and they bought me this book and all the books all the fairy tales in this book are my favorite but Rapunzel I had the most strong um, connection to and I think it's because it was about a, a little girl who's locked away just like I was and her tears you know they they healed the prince's blindness, while my tears, of course, were causing my blindness. So I think I felt a kind of symbolic connection to her. Also, it's a very puzzling fairy tale. You know, why was she locked up? Why couldn't she escape? Why didn't the prince just bring a, a, a you know, some rope and get her out of there? You know, did she ever see her parents again? And, you know, the more you ask yourself questions, the more you begin to formulate answers for it, and that is what leads to a story. So did you know way back then that you wanted to write a, a novel about Rapunzel? I, I was probably in my teens when I first began to think about writing, maybe 12 or 13, um, when I first began to read fairy tale retellings. And I thought, oh, one day I'll write a, a retelling of Rapunzel. And then I studied fairy tales in my first degree, and that kind of got me even more interested in, in the tale. Um, so yes, I've been thinking about it for a long, long time. I don't actually remember when I first began to you know, seriously consider writing one. I didn't realise you were such a fairy tale addict. This goes way back. It does. <laughs> um, how did you go about your research of um, seven, 16th and 17th century European life? Books. Great piles of thick, heavy, hard to read books. Um, really, I think it took me about four or five years just to research. Um, and just to formulate my plan and what I was going, actually going to write. Um, of course, the internet was a big help as well. But um, the main problem for me was that Charlotte Rose de la Force was an unknown writer. She was like a footnote in history. Nothing had been written about her. And so I actually I found a very small biography of hers that was written in dense academic French. And I had to pay someone to translate that into English for me. And then I spent a long time just reading memoirs and diaries and letters um, you know, written by other people at the court of the Sun King and every now and again she'd be mentioned normally because she was causing a scandal. So did you travel to France and Italy? I did. I took my three children and me. We went and spent um, a month or two travelling around. Um, we went to the chateau where Charlotte Rose was born. I saw the cot. I saw her little pram 
when she was a baby, um, I saw where she grew up, and then of course we went to Venice as well, where the uh, Rapunzel part of the story is set in Venice. That was wonderful. So how many years in the making was this book? Well, the first mention that I was seriously considering writing a Rapunzel retelling was in my diary. I keep a diary every day and have done since I was 12. Wow. And so I, all I wrote in it was, um, I'm very keen on writing a, re, uh, a retelling of Rapunzel, a dark gothic retelling of a dark gothic fairy tale. And that was almost exactly seven years ago. March seven years ago. Wow, do you go back over your diaries a lot? I went back to find out when I first you know, wrote down the idea, because I always do write down my ideas in there. So I went back and read, and read through them to find it. Let's talk a bit about the process that you went through mm. writing Bitter Greens. Um, I hear you are a scrapbooker, you're a diary writer. I do. Do you, so you keep a lot of pictures and inspiration? I do. I've actually bought my oh, notebook you have to not. show you. Yes. yes, you have. So there's one for each of the major characters. So this is the Rapunzel story and also the witch. Wow. And this is a notebook for Charlotte Rose. That's not her. I was about to say, no, is that what she looks like? That's not her, but that's just how I imagine she might have looked when she was young. Cause yeah. you know, it's a, she's got a quill in her hand. And so, and basically what I do with my notebooks is there's a lot of visual. I have a very visual imagination. And any bit of scrap of paper where I, I write things on, get stuck in there. So what I like is that you can see the very first beginnings of my ideas, which are usually quite vague and you know without much focus. And then gradually you can see how I begin to focus in on my on my characters and on my on the era. And it's got maps in there, it's got character outlines, it's everything is all kept in the one place. Amazing. I'm I know a... they're gonna be worth an absolute fortune one day. Oh, that's what I was just thinking. You should keep my those children's close college by your fund. Side. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, so you've written both adults and children's books, but Bitter Greens contains quite a few very it's adult a bit saucy, scenes. Isn't it? Oh, very saucy. Mm. Um, how do you find the transition between children's and adults' books? Look, I don't have any trouble with it at all. When I'm writing a children's book, I know that I'm writing a children's book. And when I'm writing a book for adults, I know and the story tells itself quite naturally. Um, I think I have a kind of ideal reader in mind. So when I'm writing a children's book, I think about what I wanted to read when I was 12 and what I would have found frightening or off-putting or disturbing. And so I don't put those things in it. When I'm writing for young adults, I think of myself when I was 16 or 17 and you know, what I passionately believed and what I wanted to read about. And when I write for adults, I'm writing for myself as I am now. I don't mind a little bit of sauciness. Now now you've joined a long list of authors now that have retold mm. Rapunzel, as is the way that you're you know, studying for your doctorate. What are the sort of themes and ideas that you wanted to explore that other authors hadn't yet done? Well, I always thought that the Rapunzel story was a story about, about desire, about obsession, about power. And I was always interested that, to me, you know, I studied fairy tales in my first degree and they're always talking about it as being you know an overprotective mother well you know if a girl nowadays is stolen from her parents or taken forcibly from her parents and locked away we don't really think it's because the you know the woman that has locked her away thinks well by her it seemed to me that a lot of the, the charge of terror and despair was taken out of the Rapunzel story basically it was first told by a woman and then all the retellings were done by men after that. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it, to me, it was always a, a story about female power. And so that's what I think drew me to it and what I was most intrigued by it. And so um, to me, it was very important to sort of rescue Rapunzel from being seen as this passive character that just, you know, sat there waiting to be rescued. Well, in the original story, she was actually very active. She was an agent for, you know, redemption and healing. And I mean, she bore twins by herself in the wilderness. That was awful. Uh, that's right. In and the cave. Well, when oh. the Grimm brothers retold Rapunzel, they took away her pregnancy and they took away the fact that she bore twins by herself, which kind of made her a much more passive character. So I, I wanted her to have some kind of agency. I loved the characters, especially that they were female, strong characters mm. in that time. Um, I've got a question from one of our Facebook fans from the Random House Facebook page. Feel free to join up. Um, it's from Rachel McDiarmid and she says, out of the three women uh, you write about, who was your favourite and why? Well, I loved them all. Um, obviously the character of the witch was a dark, 
difficult and disturbing tale and I actually um, found some parts of it really difficult to write. I'd, I'd have to get up and move away from the computer and have a few deep breaths and then, and then go back to it. Which bits? Oh, I think, think you can probably guess. Hmm. Okay. And this, I love the character of Margarita, but she was a child in many of them. It's a character of Charlotte Rose that really spoke to me. I mean, I, I discovered her by accident. She was a real leaving, you know, living, breathing woman, passionate, funny and a great storyteller and you know when she was locked up in the convent she was the same age as I am now so I really connected with that I imagine what would it be like if someone locked me up and said that I wasn't allowed to you know live my life the way I wanted to live it I too would have been defiant and angry and rebelled so no Charlotte Rose just does it for me absolutely she's was such an amazing person and I love the fact that um, she's been forgotten and I hopefully have, have brought her out of obscurity again. Now the question that we like to ask all of our authors, yes. um, what is the book that has most influenced your life and why? I would have to say The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis yeah. because it was my first book that I ever read all by myself. My aunt was reading it to um, my sister and I and my sister's two and a half years older than me and she would go and and take it away and start reading it. And go, oh, I can't believe that just happened. Uh -huh. And so I picked it up and I began to read it and, and those mysterious black marks on the page became words. And after that I could read anything I wanted and it was just such a revelation. Wow, interesting. Well, thank you so much, Kate. It's my pleasure. If you'd like to read a sample chapter of Bitter Greens, you can do that at randomhouse.com.au. Next month, we're gonna be chatting to Drusilla Majeska, author of The Mountain. See you then.